ashes, and I'd like to invite Peter this afternoon's congregation. Thanks, Matt. Let's all uh, seek God in prayer now. Father in heaven, we ask that you'll be with Fountain, the program this afternoon, the children's program as well, and the other ministries of the church. We ask you to be close to those who are worshipping on your holy Sabbath. May we get a rich blessing and be filled with the Spirit, Lord. Lord, we come to you today with many cares. We have worries, Lord. But we ask that your Spirit will calm us, give us peace. We ask that you'll forgive our sins, those things that we've done that we're not proud of, and give us a renewed spirit, Lord. We ask that you'll be with the speaker, Baron, this afternoon, as he brings the message from your word. Thank you for hearing our prayer, Lord. We ask these things in the name of your blessed Son. Good afternoon, everybody. Afternoon. Good. So, talking again about the return of the exile, part three, three things. They were finding the ruins and they had to deal with that. That's not easy, but that's what had to happen. They certainly had to find forgiveness. The greatest necessity for the returnees was forgiveness. Acquittal. And then they have to find restoration. Being forgiven is one thing. But being restored is another. Do you understand what I'm saying here? Now, so that is what had to happen. You know, I watch the world news. And I look at the Chinese stock market. Or the China slump as they call it. What would you say to those poor people who are losing their savings? They often have borrowed against the house. Or if they couldn't afford to buy a house, they've put it all in the stock market. They use what is called leverage, which multiply your profits if you go up but it certainly multiplies your losses when it goes down. And that's a big impact. I think this still will have an effect here with us as well. Greed or bad luck. Why is it that so many people, why is it that so many people are so obsessed in possessing money, property, Whatever. Their greatest need is not greed or bad luck. Look at what happens to Greece. They'll determine tomorrow whether they're going to stay most likely in the euro or not. It is certainly an understatement to say that uncertainty plagues this planet. We live in a world of uncertainty. Globally it is true, nationally it's true, collectively it is true, individually it is true. You could find yourself in a waiting room hearing what you don't want to hear. It's true. Here is something that has also intrigued me. When I look at the world news and I watch CNN and Al Jazeera, but particularly CNN, it is true to say that to get a million people to a service is quite a, quite a mark, isn't it? Uh, we've made a modest beginning here, but it's, uh, we've got a long way to go. He's popular. <clears throat> He's very good with kids. And I respect and I, 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 I look at the dedication and I find it very remarkable. The enthusiasm is palpable on those meetings. 
I have a problem though. And this is what Jesus once said on the Sermon on the Mount. He said this, Let your light so shine before men that they will glory who? Your heavenly Father. That's my problem with this. The glory is not going to our heavenly Father. And I have a problem with the title Holy Father. I, I also think of this text. All who dwell on the earth will worship him. What I saw was worship, but not where it should go. Whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. There is a popularity that I understand, but does it glorify God? Is what I question. And it, when I see this, makes me aware <clears throat> that what was predicted almost 2,000 or say 1,900 years ago plus, and I see it unfolding today, there is an urgency about this church and its message that it gets out to the people. So, suppression. He did mention the right things. He mentions human trafficking. It's a crime. It is a crime against humanity. Of course, it is a crime against God because every human being is the property of God. But as it was in the days of Noah, when violence was paramount, you will see that we are now having an endemic problem with human trafficking. I find it the most objectionable crimes that is still permitted to occur. If there was more political will, it could be addressed, I'm sure. But there has to be the political will to do so. That's the world that we live in. What we need is freedom from all those terrible things. Political violence, for whatever reasons, we face this every day. I find myself looking at world history culminating towards one thing. Jesus is coming back. Amen. That's what I see. And so, climate change. And I know the Pope got that one as well. Climate change. Is it already too late? I, I find it a fascinating topic. There is climate change. There is no question about it. It will culminate. It proves one thing. This planet has a use by date. And if only they would follow the book of Genesis, they could understand and explain what is happening today. Guilt. One of the most debilitating things that happen to us is guilt. Guilt haunts you, doesn't it? It is a feeling so profound. It is a feeling that really, really disables you. What we need is to get rid of that. That is what we really need. Who wants to be guilty? There is nothing worse than being guilty. So, here is the power of forgiveness. We talk about this a lot. Forgiving is important. The capacity to forgive and the fact that you are forgiven. You know, I'll have a good story on the end of this that you need to hear. I still hate to be reminded of shortcomings. Do you know what I mean? I still hate to be reminded of things that I would have done and did do wrong. Why is it that Satan keeps trying to bring that back to you? He is trying to bring that back to you to disable you to go forward. Do you understand? It's a very common ploy. The power of forgiveness. Very few people have been able to pass that on. The greatest need of mankind is forgiveness. The one man who had that capacity was Nelson Mandela. I, I still respect that man immensely. 
and the, the, the picture isn't very clear because it was a low, uh, sort of uh, a small picture, but he said, as I walked out the door towards the gate that would lead to my freedom, he was in prison for no good reason for 25 years. Because obviously he was opposing apartheid. He said, as I walked out of the door towards the gate that would lead to my freedom, I knew if I didn't leave my bitterness and hatred behind, I'd still be in prison. Do you understand that? Your happiness to a degree is determined by your capacity to forgive. If you have that capacity to forgive, you will be a much happier person. You don't bear a grudge. That's fantastic. I tell you, the one thing that makes you even more happier, when you realize how much God has forgiven you. This is a key. The happiest people are the people who have been forgiven much. Very important. The power of forgiveness determines one's life. Of course, there's a condition. True forgiveness is total and complete. When people say, I forgive but I don't forget, forget it. They haven't forgiven. You understand that? This is important. To the Hebrew, the heart, the mind is, is the mind. you got to forgive them from the mind. So it is important. Forgiveness, the power of forgiveness. And of course to us as Christians, it means that we will be covered. You, you, you get that from the picture, that we will be covered with the righteousness of Christ. It's true. But I just want to dwell a little bit on this topic. And there is no better place in the Bible than the third chapter of the book of Zechariah to come into an understanding what that actually means. Martin Luther King Jr. said this, Forgiveness is not an occasional act. Forgiveness is an attitude. I want you to remember that. It's an attitude. You're not counting. And then you also have to incorporate in forgiveness, you've got to forgive yourself. I know people who can forgive others, but they can't forgive themselves. Don't be one of them. You have to forgive yourself as well. Please, remember that. So, we go to the third chapter of the book of Zechariah. Zechariah, as you know, was one of the two prophets with Haggai for the returnees when they came out of Babylon. Only a remnant of some 50,000 came out of Babylon to build, rebuild Jerusalem and the temple. Everything was in ruins. And these two prophets had a tremendous impact with their ministry. They had an excellent leader by the name of Zerubbabel. They had a faithful high priest by the name of Joshua. And they had two prophets, very capable, by the name of Hechai and Zechariah. And this is the one that is recorded by Zechariah. The year is about 52518 BC, when this particular vision was given. A message to the spiritual leader of the returnees. Now, the reason of its importance is this. We often think of the Bible, particularly of the Old Testament, as something that happened a long time ago. And it did happen a long time ago. But we would make the greatest mistake if we did not recognize that what happened so long ago has a tremendous application for us here and now. And particularly each individual here. Do never think that what is now being taught and, and, and examined does not apply to you, because it does. Because it does. Now, he showed me Joshua the high priest. 
Now the he here really is the angel of the Lord. And I'll he be mentioned again. And I want to identify for you who the angel of the Lord truly is. That's coming in a minute. So now we talk about the spiritual leader of the Israelites or the, the Jews that have come out of exile. Are you with me? So they have come out of exile and their spiritual leader now is standing before the angel of the Lord. The one who is showing this is the angel of the Lord. And when you look at the Hebrew here, Malach Yavah, without a definite article, and I won't go too much in that today, Fred, it means God. Do you know that, uh, you know the name of Michael, don't you? Michael, in the Hebrew. Mi, who, ga, like, el, singular for Elohim. Who is like God? There is only one archangel. There's only one archangel, and that is the one, as the Greek says, arche, in the active form, it is the cause of all the angels. The one who created all the angels, as he did create everything else. This is none other than the pre-incarnate Christ in his full authority as deity. Do we understand who we're talking about here? When we talk about the angel of the Lord. And that, there is no higher authority than this authority. Joshua the high priest is standing before the angel of the Lord. Here it gets really interesting. Satan standing on what side? At his right side. Whose right side? What is the antecedent? Yeah, Joshua. Correct. So he is standing at the right side to oppose whom? Who is he opposing? Joshua. Okay. Also the angel of the Lord, as you will see. What we have here, he stands there, he is opposing. Satan, Hasatan in the Hebrew means the accuser. It comes from the verb Satan. <coughs> It's someone who accuses. Do you know anybody that always keeps pointing the finger at someone? Oh, they're around. Just turn your back for a while. They're around. They are. That is Satan's job. Do you know that the Bible teaches that God hates the pointing of the finger? Meaning, it's an Hebraic expression for accusing somebody. That's what it means. So, we have the high priest standing before the highest authority in the universe. And we have the main opponent of the human race. What would you call a scene like this? We have a judge, we have a prosecutor, and we have a defendant. It's a court case. It's a court case. Mind you, it's a vision. But God is teaching. He's teaching the Jews. They are discouraged because their temple is just not progressing. Disappointment is a luxury we can't afford. If you work for God, you can't afford the luxury of disappointment. You just get back on your knees. Now, I have a judge. Jesus, when he was walking around this planet, the dusty land of Palestine, he did say something like this. All judgment has been given to the Son. So, all judgment, 
goes to the second member of the Godhead, who is also known as the Malach Yevah. He is the same person. The prosecutor or the accuser is who? Satan. Satan. He is standing at the right hand of Joshua. They are facing the highest authority in the universe. Christ as God. So, on which side of the ruler of the universe is Satan? Work it out. Yes. Absolutely. That's a bad sign. Because if Satan is on the left, who stands on the right? Joshua. Right is the side of favor. Now, a Semitic person would face orientate to the east. My left side is north. What does north entail in the Hebrew? Judgment. judgment. All the judgment, the enemies of God's people would come from the north by way of punishment. On my right, what is that? South. The south side is the side of favor. When a, a name sake by the name of Zachariah was approached by the angel Gabriel announcing the up and coming birth of John the Baptist, he appeared to him when he was ministering in the holy place. And he got the fright of his life when he saw the angel. But you know the Bible says he the angel was standing at the south side of the altar, which is the side of favor. Now, so here we have a huge argument. Let me, let me spice it up. This is well before the cross. You know, salvation has not yet been established. Everything that is done is done on the strength of what that angel, the angel of the Lord, is going to do. Do you understand? He has to become the ultimate sacrifice before he can be the ultimate priest. This is not the capacity of priest that he's standing here. That has to come later. The sacrifice comes first. But he's looking at one that is actually representing it. It's a very interesting scenario. You have a human high priest. <coughs> Let me ask you a question. When would the high priest of Israel meet or get very close, as close as possible, with God? Once a year. Once a year. What was the name of that day? The Yom Kippur or the Yom HaKippurim, which means it is the day of atonement, or literally the day of coverings. So you have a priest that once a year would approach God, and who did the priest, the high priest, represent? Jesus Christ. On the one hand. On the other hand, on whose behalf was he standing before God? Yes, the people. The man here is representing the people. Joshua is representing Israel or the Jews. That's what's happening. That's why it's so important. Now, the thing is this. <coughs> the real accusation by Satan is really against God. Let me ask you this question. Can Satan be saved? No, never. Because he's incapable of repentance anyway. He has crossed every line. Now, we have an opportunity, correct? Because 
the angel of the Lord that we see that has made this possible. He went for you to the cross. Now Satan is trying to do this. He is trying to bring you in such... Firstly, he wants to entice you to sin. If you wonder why sinning is so easy, piece of cake, because Satan will help you do it. He's very helpful like that. <laughs> then when you have done that, he is the first to accuse you before God. Look at him. Look at her. That's what happens. Because he does not want you to be saved. Satan does not want you to make it into heaven. Satan wants you to be lost like he is. Do you understand that? It is a passion of him. It is an obsession of him. That is what he is all about. Yeah? Satan is our enemy. Now his real accusation is against God. What he is saying to God is this. There before you stands a sinner. Now whether this is Joshua, the high priest, representing the Jews that came back from exile, or whether it is you, Satan will accuse you of everything. Remember, remember, people forget. You know, I can see you, you can see me. But we're not the only ones in this room. Do you understand this? There are angels' presence, and there could be more of them than there are of us. We don't see them, but they can hear every word we say. They record everything we do, or don't do. The, all the deeds of our records are there, and there are things that angels and even Satan cannot see. He cannot read your mind. Though he's a very keen observer, he cannot look inside your head. But God can. Do you understand? So his accusation is to God, you are being unreasonable. Look at me, I'm rejected, but you are accepting a sinner. Can you see the dilemma? At this stage, the penalty for sin, what is the, what is the wages of sin? Death. death. The that's eternal death. You understand, not the physical one. We all die that unless Jesus comes first, which is quite possible. What you need to understand, what you need to understand, the price for the salvation of the people has not been paid yet. It's still 500 and plus years away. Do you understand? So he stands before the angel, and whilst the argument is not about eternal life, it is about one thing about one thing. Joshua is representing the people. Satan is claiming that they are not worthy of rebuilding the temple. If Satan can stop the rebuilding of the temple, how are the people going to worship God? Yeah? If Satan can stop you from rebuilding a church, and doing outreach, who's going to get on to those people? This is what Satan wants. That's exactly what he is about. He hated the thought of the temple being rebuilt. The sacrifices pointing to the ultimate sacrifice. The confessions of sins. The forgiveness. And the atonement. He hates that. And he hasn't changed. And he still has the same attitude towards a church. 
reinstituting the worship of the Lord God, there was nothing worse in this mind of Satan than this to find place. And he was saying to God, these people, they have sinned. That's why they were sent to exile. They are falling short. They knew they were doing wrong. And now you use them to rebuild the temple, to set up the worship system again. You see, Satan actually is not wrong. You find in this vision, Joshua is saying nothing. He has no defense. But I love what the Lord said. And of course, the angel of the Lord is the Lord. So you read here, Lord. The Lord rebukes you, Satan. That means he is told to back off. It's not that he was lying. Satan was not lying here. He was accusing. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebukes you. Satan's argument is right. Not because it's wrong, but because it's not accepted. And here's the explanation. Is this not a branch, Jerusalem, the Jews, plucked from the fire? Do you understand what is meant by this? Something is in a fire and you manage, though it's damaged, you manage to retrieve it. You understand? So it is saved, it is not destroyed. And the Lord says, that is how it is with Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem is like a branch. God will never defend the sins of his children. That is not what's happening here. God is not denying that Israel has sinned and has fallen short. God will never defend the sins of his children, but he will always defend his children. Did you get that? He will defend you. The same person in vision will defend you. You have a mighty defense attorney in heaven. Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments standing before the angel. That word there, that word there, so we in the Hebrew means absolutely disgustingly filthy. It, it, it couldn't be worse. It is something to be totally abhorred. So Joshua was clothed with filthy garments. He was standing before the Lord. Now what does the filthy garments, what do they stand for? Sin, Sin. correct, you're right. Sin. Then he answered and spoke to those who stood before him. This is the angel of the Lord speaking, saying, this is what he's saying, take away the filthy garment from him. How does God save you? Every one of you here needs saving, correct? So it is imperative that we understand or as much as we can how God saves us, correct? Well, when you are stained, the stains are there because of your conduct. In the case of the high priest, it's the conduct of the people. Are the people guilty? Oh, yes, they are. Are you guilty? Of course you are. Me too. What God does, he removes the stains. That's the first thing you need. Only God can do that. You can't do that. It takes God to do that. And to him he said that the Lord speaking to Joshua, see, I have removed your iniquity from you. Who removed the iniquity from Joshua? God. And I will close you with rich robes. You don't do that. 
It took me decades to learn that I couldn't do that, that I could not remove iniquity and that I could not close myself, meaning be good enough. It was always a great frustration. Take away the filthy garment. I like this. Have a look at this. What God says here, but what Jesus, who went for you to the cross, said in this vision, before he had paid the penalty, he said, take away the filthy garments. But he didn't say, take away the filthy sinner. You understand? He doesn't say that. That is still true today. He has never changed his attitude towards you. That's the love of God. He said, let them put a clean turban on his head. You know, the priest used to have, the high priest had a turban. And there was a gold plate with a chain around it. Do you remember what was on, engraved on that little gold plate? Holiness to the Lord. From right to left. Kodesh, that means holiness. It's a, it's a noun. La means to. Yeva is what we call the tetragrammaton. That is the personal name of God. Holiness to the Lord. Kodesh la Yeva. That is on your brains. You understand? The mitre is on your head. It was on the forehead. What's in the forehead? Well, obviously, there's our intellect. It's what we think. Do you understand? Highly symbolic. So he now is equipped with a clean turban which has the newest inscription on it, no doubt. He is now qualified. And then they put a clean turban on his head. They put the clothes, the clean clothes on him. It is amazing. That one day we will walk around and nobody will ever remember anything we have done wrong, including you. Did you hear? One day you cannot recall anything you did do wrong. You will know you're redeemed. You'll always know that. The scars on the hand and the feet of Christ are there. But the reality is, you are so free from any guilt, it doesn't exist anymore. <coughs> how, how would you like to live like that? Amen. That's good. That's good. And the angel of the Lord stood by. You see, he oversees everything. God <coughs> oversees everything. The trouble is that we genuinely desire to reflect Christ to unbelievers, but our life is still a cracked mirror that distorts his image. Have you ever looked in a mirror that was completely cracked? And it distorts your image, isn't it? You look very strange, normally not an improvement. Now, Charles Spurgeon, the early 19th, 20th century preacher, I, I like him very much, uh, he said this, our best performances are so stained with sin that it is hard to know whether they are good works or bad works. Does that get through? We don't even know. We can't even qualify. Are we, our deeds, are, as it says in Isaiah, that, that our deeds are all like filthy rags. Paul quoted from that. We don't really know because we're so sinful. Then you say, and you often, and you and I have been there many times, I vow to change. You say to God, you say to God, I'll never do this again. Yeah? Please forgive me, I'll never do this again. And you don't, but never is a short time. I vow to change, but who sings the song? You. Can you change yourself? No, you can't. 
So how do we fight our demons? Because there are demons pressing upon us, getting us, enticing us, wanting us to keep doing the wrong thing. How do we fight our demons? In fact, you don't fight your demons. If there's one thing learned from the third chapter of the book of Zechariah, you don't do the fighting. Because you'll lose. You lose. It's like <coughs> the potter. The potter makes from the clay the dish, the vase, whatever it may be. And, and, and the clay never objects. The clay never tells the potter what to do. We are like the clay. We should be like the clay. As I said, the clay doesn't tell the potter what to do. I can't understand why there are people who are telling God what to do. You can't. We have to have a submission, a total submission. I like that image. Just give yourselves into the hand of God. It's a safe place. What you and I need, the whole art of Christianity, is that total surrender. You have to surrender. You understand. It won't work without it. You don't fight your demons. You'll never clean up. But he can clean you up. So he takes away the filthy clothes. He takes away, he takes away, Ezekiel would say, the stony heart. That heart that can't change. And then he gives you a new spirit. And then he gives you a new mind. And then he closes you also with his righteousness. The record that you have is stained, but he covers you with his righteousness. It was a marvelous thing to discover that it will never be, it will never be my improvement on my life that will get me into heaven. It is the light of Christ that covers me and it covers you. True? Amen. Absolutely. And so, then the angel of the Lord admonished Joshua. Thus says the Lord, it doesn't stop here. If you walk in my ways, he has now received the robe of righteousness. You understand? He says, if you walk in my ways, what would God mean by that? Well, look at the parallelism. And if you keep my commandment. What is so typical about the end time people just before Jesus returns? The end time church. What do they do? The yeah, they keep the commandments and have the faith of Jesus. They keep the commandments. Don't let anybody tell you they're old-fashioned, they're done away with, they don't know what they're talking about. If you walk in my ways, that is a proactive part, and you keep my commands, then you shall also judge my house. Judge means not that it is given to us to judge the people here, but one day, of course, when we read the records in heaven and learn about those who didn't make it, yes, we participate in that, but it is really, a uh, judging is really, uh, you are in charge. In fact, really, when you look at the next verse, and likewise have charge of my courts, these were the parting words of the dying King David to his son Solomon. One day, God will appoint us for things that you mind cannot even reach. God has plans for you and me. Now and for the hereafter. If you get there. Marvelous plans. I will give you places to walk. Note this. And he qualifies that. Among those who stand in. There were celestial beings standing around the angel being God. They come from heaven. What he is saying, you will walking here in heaven. I don't know how often you think about it. Imagine physically walking in heaven. I sometimes, when things look a bit grim, I, I cast my mind to the new Jerusalem. 
the place that Jesus promised he would prepare. And I visualize the wonderful balmy air, the beautiful flowers, the beautiful stream, the river coming from the throne of God. And what will the tree of life be looking like? I, I sometimes wish I could get a five minute look in. You know what I mean? Half an hour would be better. But there is things laid aside for us so good. You must do everything in your capacity to connect with God who can get you there. Hear, O Joshua the high priest, he says, you and your companions, that is his fellow workers, his fellow Israelites and Jews, he said, he said you and your companions who sit before you, for they are a wondrous sign. God says, they will be a sign. They will be an example. They will be viewed by the other nations. And they will see the blessings that God can give you if you walk in his ways. That is the promise to Israel then. And that is the promise to Israel now. The same promise applies to you. You just have to walk in his ways. You do. For behold, I'm bringing forth the branch, my servant the branch. Here he is announcing himself. Because this is the second member of the Godhead who says, I'm coming. And all of this, what he's just done for Israel, all what he's just done for Joshua, will be qualified, will be qualified by the life he led. Walking into the Garden of Gethsemane, the oil press, remember that? When the Holy Spirit was squeezed out of him. When the burden of all the sin of the world were loaded upon him. And he couldn't see beyond the portals of the grave, but he walked by faith, towards Calvary and endured, endured the insults that were hurled at him. He paid a price for you and me. He paid a price. The promise, my servant the Brahms, oh he kept it. He came. Some 500 odd years later, he came. God's promises are like the stars. When the night is dark, real, real dark, the brighter they shine. You just have to learn to hold on to the promises of God. And so we go to Zechariah, a message for the civil leader. The civil leader. Now the angel who talked to me came back, this is Christ. He awakened me as a man who was awakened out of his sleep and he said to me, what do you see? And then he said something interesting. Zechariah says, well, Lord, I'm, I'm looking and there is a lampstand of solid gold with a bowl on top of it. And now, what, what does that remind you of? Huh? The lampstand. Yes, very good. Yeah. That's the lampstand, the menorah. Seven branches. Well, what's the lampstand? What, what does it stand for? Okay, first we have the candle holder. What does that stand for? It's purity. You remember the book of Revelation, he walks through the lampstands. What are the lampstands there? Churches, that's right. The churches. The light. What is the light? Hmm? Now what is the light? The? Word of God. The? Word of God. Yes, the word of God. D David, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. It's the word of God. Now, how can it burn? How can that light come into being? Oil. What is the oil? The Holy Spirit. 
Can you see that ultimately here perhaps the lampstand is Christ himself? But it's also the church that works with Christ, as it is so revealed in the book of Revelation. Then the light is the word of God, and it is fed by the Holy Spirit. Do you understand how the message of salvation is to go on being proclaimed? That's what he sees. It's a commission. Seven lamps, seven pipes to the seven lamps. Two olive trees are by it, one at the right bowl, one at the, at the left. And he asked him, he said, I see these two olive trees feeding actually the oil to that seven brass candlestick. He said, what does it mean? What does it mean? He's asking God, he's asking Jesus. He said to him, these are the two anointed ones who stand beside the Lord of the whole earth. Now we have a vision like that in the 11th chapter of the book of Revelation. And there it represents the Old Testament and the New Testament, the two anointed ones. But here, the two anointed ones, the New Testament has not been written yet. So we only have the Old Testament. So what might they be? Can I put it to you, and commentators have argued about this, the law and the prophets. The law and the prophets. It is the word of God that is sent by God through his agencies. This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit. If there is one lesson that we should truly learn, there is no power we can muster to save ourselves. To proclaim the word so others will accept it. It is of no avail unless the spirit works. And it is through the spirit. Never through our doing. It is through the spirit. Who are you, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel? You shall become a plain. It was so encouraging to their civil leader. He was actually from the line of David. He was so encouraged by that. Do you know, when he, when he heard these things, these encouragements, he, he resumed with a zeal the rebuilding of the temple, and that temple was finished in just a few years. Marvelous what, he can, what God can do. The mountain becomes a plain, and he shall bring forth the capstone. The capstone is the highest stone on the building there of, of the temple. So he, God says, will finish building the temple. And the same promise comes to us. If we start, if we walk in his way, we will finish. We will finish. And that's our destiny. Forgiven, you know, restored. You can only be restored if you're forgiven. And thank God I am forgiven. Do you ever thank God that you're forgiven? We always ask for forgiveness. But do we praise him for having forgiven us? Very important that you do. Empowered by God to do his work. This is what we really want. Notice that the sinner here, in the case of the third chapter of the book of Zechariah, is not about a sinner being put on probation. In other words, if you behave yourself, it'll be okay. He's not put on probation. He was put back to work. Because that garment, that turban, meant you are back on the job. There's only one way to live. I hope you remember this. You have to serve God. There's no other way to live. It isn't worth it without that. And so, what keeps us attached to God is never our strength. You know what it is? We can't hold on to God, but it is His love. It is His love that holds us to Him. It's the love of God that keeps us attached to Him. Can you please understand that? 
and appreciate the love of God. Return from exile? Good. If we confess our sins, you know that. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and then what he does, uh, does he do? Finish this one for me. And cleanse us from how much of wild unrighteousness? Oh. Oh, he gives you the rope of righteousness. He enables you to work for him, to live for him. Return from exile, it means you go back to work. Do you understand that? Christianity is an active state of mind and being and work. John Wesley <coughs> so is impressed by the third chapter of the book of Zechariah and this statement here, is it not a branch plucked from the fire? Why? Because as a six-year-old there was a fire in the house where he lived with his family and everybody got out <coughs> but he was upstairs in the rectory and, and somehow for some reason they, everybody forgot about him and he was still in the burning house and he thought as a six year old he was going to die he got close to the window as close as he could and if it wasn't one for the fact for one of his neighbors who stood on the shoulders of another man knocked in the window and pulled that kid out of that window just before it collapsed seconds to go and that made a very deep impact on this man, John Wesley, who with his brother Charles, of course, were the founders of the Methodist. You know that. I really wanted to talk in closing on Martin Luther, that great reformer. It's only a short story. Martin Luther, and the year would have been about 5, 15, 22, 23. He stayed at a place called the Wartburg Castle in Eisenach, Germany. Uh, it was owned by Frederick of, of, Frederick of Saxony, which was, who was the one who protected him from the medieval church who wanted to execute him and kill him. So it was an imposed sort of a, for his own good type of uh, incarceration. And there he Martin Luther prayed, worked, thought, and he, he wrote on that day, and I forgot the date, he wrote a letter to a, a man by the name of Philip, um, Philip uh, Melanchthon, one of his fellow reformers. And he candidly admits to this man, he said, I'm getting into depression here. I'm sinking deeper and deeper and deeper. He said, the problem is, the problem is, I know what to do. But there's burning inside me a lust that is burning inside of me desires that I don't want and it doesn't get any better. He struggled with that. His mistakes, his shortcomings. And it looked terrible. And then one night, when he actually had written that letter, there was a dream that he had. And if ever you go to that place, they will explain that. Because against the wall there, against the wall here somewhere, is a, they call it Luther's ink stain. Now you wonder, how does he get that stain on that wall? And the guide, if they're any good, will tell you the story. What happened was this. In his dream, in his vision, Satan entered that very room. And he had with him a long scroll. And he began to read. And he began to read about Martin Luther's life. All the things that he had done wrong. And he kept on reading, reading, reading. More reading. And the depression that got hold of Martin Luther was so severe that he took his ink pot, he took his ink pot, and he threw it in his dream. He threw it at Satan. Because it hit the wall. But then Satan disappeared. And this is what Luther said. And this is what made 
to the mind of Luther, Satan disappear. It's not the ink pot. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. He shouted it out. And that's the truth. Isn't it? That's the truth. I love that story. It's good. I hope it's your story too. Tell Satan when he reminds you of any wrongdoing, go to Jesus. He's dealt with this. <laughs> do we have a special item? Yes, we do. <coughs> Surrender humbly at 
One more time. Let's sing it louder. Heavenly Father, as the song said, as the hymn said, I surrender all. I, I, I hope I speak on behalf of everybody here. I surrender all. It isn't worth it not to surrender. What am I going to keep? What is any of us going to cling to? What will it do for us if it comes between you and us? We need to surrender. We need to go to work for you. Convict us that we are redeemed for service. That we may live accordingly. Think accordingly. Work accordingly. Thank you for all that you have done for us. You gift yourself. We thank you for that. Lord, as we go out of this place, we pray that you uh, bless the fellowship and that you remain amongst our number and that uh, the food will nourish our bodies and we thank you for those who prepared it. And particularly when we leave this campus, Lord, when we go to our daily routines, <coughs> I really hope and pray that this hour of worship has made a difference. And that we will be more and better equipped by that surrender that we are compelled to work for you and with you. Bless us now. We pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.